Professor Mahdi, Dean of the Faculty, Professor Miezwa, Head of School, Mati Fanikak, Head of the Occupational Therapy Department, Occupational Therapy Staff, Distinguished Guests, Colleagues, Students and Friends. I greet you at the start of the Celebratory Symposium from Scotland, where I'm doing granny duty. It is with great sadness that I'm not here in person to celebrate 80 years of the WITS Occupational Therapy Department, a department that has molded both my professional and personal life over four and a half decades. Matty and Tanya, thank you very much for the privilege of presenting this keynote address. I hope I can do justice to the rich history and the contribution this OT program has brought to the South African occupational therapy landscape. Selecting the critical events over the past 80 years to fit this presentation has been a challenge. This address I've divided up into three parts. Yesterday, a review mostly of the undocumented history of the department between the years 1943 and 2017. Today, some reflections and thoughts on the current situation between 2018 and 2023. And tomorrow, some thoughts on the education and training of future occupational therapists to meet the diverse needs of the South African population. While the focus of this presentation is on the department, the department and the education program has never operated in a vacuum. Both have been influenced by a complex, multi-layered context of the faculty, university, profession, locally, nationally and internationally, the socio-political financial status of our country, the expertise and leadership within the department, the needs and aspirations of the student body, as well as the care needed by our service users and disabled people in particular. Each aspect has provided opportunities and challenges to the departmental development. So let's go to yesterday. And I'm going to start with the early years from 1943 to 1960. The Occupational Therapy Department at WITS has its thanks to the initiative of two medical students who were pained at the spectacle of two old African gentlemen with TB lying just waiting to die in the then non-European hospital. They showed them how to knit. The positive effects of this activity resulted in a group, the group of medical students teaching many other patients at the hospital to knit. The knitting project was extended to the ward of ambulant children. Later, these same medical students commandeered and erected a stall in the grounds of the hospital and equipped it with toys for the children to play with. Professor Raymond Dart's attention was drawn to this work and he became a very influential champion of occupational therapy. Dr. Humphrey Rakes, then principal of the university, inaugurated the first diploma course in occupational therapy in South Africa. Two teachers, a Miss Kuzak and MacArthur, were recruited from England. Their sea journey to South Africa was challenged by their ship being torpedoed off the west coast of Sierra Leone. They had an extended stay in Freetown with only a few clothes and what we've heard was a fur coat. Unperturbed by the loss of books and equipment required for the new program, they arrived to take up their teaching duties in an attic at the top of the old medical school. The first intake in 1943 consisted of four students. The basic sciences and applied sciences were all, all evident in these early days. Physics, chemistry and zoology, but not botany, was taught in the first year. Anatomy with dissection and physiology seems to have been taught in the second year. Psychology, medicine and surgery were taught at some time. Students learned weaving, carpentry, country dancing, exercise to music, and basketry as therapeutic activities. Clinical work in the first three years took place in a department created in the basement in one of the wards in the old Johannesburg Hospital. In the final year, the students spent three months at either Tara H. Mara Center or Starkfontein, later at Coronation, now Rahima Musa Mother and Child Hospital, and the old NEH Hospital, later called Hillbrow. And then in later years, the students also did clinical work at Grotesque and Karl Bremer in Cape Town. 
Initially, the returning home soldiers were the focus of rehabilitation for both physical and psychiatric care. Later, the polio epidemic became the focus of service delivery. Occupational therapists most commonly used craft activities and adapted games. Ms. Kuzak and Ak Arthur as WIT staff were responsible for the establishment of the South African Association of Occupational Therapy. The inaugural meeting was held in August of 1945 and was held in Medical House in Eslin Street. These two ladies were elected the chairperson and the secretary, respectively. A student occupational therapy society was also formed at this time and was represented on SAAOT. In 1946, SAOT was officially recognized as the organization representing occupational therapy nationally by the South African Medical and Dental Council and a register for occupational therapists as medical auxiliaries was opened. The WITS Occupational Therapy Program was recognized by SAMDC at this time and in 1947 the first minimum standards of training was produced. In 1947, it was agreed that students should only be trained by occupational therapists who had more than one year experience. And in September of 1948, the students requested that the OT program be upgraded to a degree course. And although this was agreed in principle in 1950, it took some 20 years for this to be implemented. In 1952, SAOT represented by Ms. Kuzak, was one of eight international OT associations to promote the development of the World Federation of Occupational Therapists. This created the international conduit for global professional development and cooperation which exists till today. Before leaving this time period, I would like to pay homage to the remarkable graduates of this time who contributed to the serving the profession well, both in South Africa and abroad. Vona de Toy, one of the first graduates, is the mother of creative ability. I acknowledge Ilse Eggers for the development of the multi-motivational multi therapeutic apparatus, Simi Sinkin for her work on activities health, and Ro Rosemary Crouch, who needs no introduction, but is famous for the first South African textbook on OT and mental health and the practice of occupational therapy in Africa. Marge Concha has been, was head of the department for 29 years, and I acknowledge her for the groundbreaking work for, in CBR and in sensory integration, and for being the first deputy dean of the faculty who was not a doctor. So now let us move from 1960 to 1990. Acceptance by the medical profession became a considerable challenge during this time, both nationally and internationally. In South Africa, occupational therapy was seen as an auxiliary and perhaps dispensable service without a th clear theoretical paradigm and no evidence to support its efficacy. To gain accept acceptance and credibility, there was a strong move within the profession towards aligning itself closely to the medical model. Teaching became very diagnostically based with OT interventions presented as in technical like steps that manage symptoms. The occupational therapy domains took a back seat over the frames of reference and associated techniques used to enable participation in steps of activities or simulated tasks rather than in activities themselves. Skills in techniques started to differentiate OTs into fields of practice. The work by Vona de Toy in an early research project aimed to provide some evidence for OT practice, resulted with the introduction of research methods and a project into all OT curriculum. Inclu also included the, at this time was vo vocational rehabilitation and creative ability as a model for practice. The more academic approach led to the extension of the education program at WITS to four years, and this led to WITS approving the introduction of the first occupational degree program in 1970. This required reorganization and upgrading of the course content to comply with the university regulations for the BSc degree. 
All of its diplomats were given an opportunity over a 10-year period to upgrade their diploma to the BSc degree by completing a research project. The introduction of the degree program enabled the development of the postgraduate program, which was introduced in 1982. The postgraduate diplomas in two fields of practice, perception and neurosciences, two master's programs by coursework and research in the same two fields, a master's by research only, and a PhD option. A third option in mental health was added to the postgraduate offerings in 1985. Pam McLaren, a Witts graduate, was the first South African occupational therapist to achieve a master's degree and a PhD. The postgraduate diplomas have not been offered since 2015, as the subsidy does not make this financially viable. The introduction of the degree program was an important milestone within the profession. It meant that occupational therapy could be classified as a profession rather than a technical service, and that had implications for remuneration and post-classification. It also contributed to the profession being able to elect the first profession-specific board within the HPCSA, which over the years has been chaired by WITS alumni. In 1972, the WITS OT department started a pro bono clinic for children with learning and associated problems, the first university to do so. This initiative was stimulated by the groundbreaking work done by Frieda Muller, a graduate who later opened the first school for children with learning problems. This clinic provided learning opportunities for undergraduate students until 2018. I joined the department in 1978. The department at this time was housed in a beautiful double-story Herbert Baker building called Low House on a rather isolated corner of the old Johannesburg Hospital in Hillbrow. We were five full-time staff, two part-time staff, and we had seven final year students. Recruitment was an important activity as we had to meet a quota of 20 students in order to make the department financially viable. We seemed to work from a course outline rather than a more a formally written curriculum. Every staff member was given hours to teach specific topics, but the actual content was up to the lecturer and was based on their clinical experience. At this time, there were no teaching aids. We lectured the students, and if they, if they needed notes, these were first handwritten and then typed out on special stencils by the secretary and then run aired by our messenger on a manual gestetner machine. The wet ink stencils were then hung all around the part department and left to dry. Because there were so few OTs in hospitals, we did a considerable amount of clinical work, primarily to ensure placement opportunities for our students. There was a close and cooperative relationship between hospital and WITS staff, <clears throat> as we were mutually dependent. WITS staff were actively engaged in the activities of SAOT. We organized several conferences here and in Africa, as well as the first Vonatoy Memorial Lecture in 1976 that was presented by Alicia Mendez, the then World Federation President. We were all required to hold some SAAOT portfolio, but all staff were members of an education committee. A major development for the department came at the end of 1982. During an HPCSA evaluation, we moved to the custom-built, very spacious department in the new Johannesburg Hospital, now Charlotte McLeckley. Close proximity made collaboration with the clinical staff also much easier, and there were several combined committees, such as the Transvaal Psychiatric Working Group, which led to some, jo some joint research and a joint publication on the stress levels of clinical staff and the reasons for them leaving the public sector. At this time, student numbers were also increasing, and we were meeting the targeted 35, year, 35 students in the first year intake. Stress levels of students even at this time were concerning, as was the high failure rate in first and second year. 
Rose Crouch undertook several studies that explored stress levels in OT students compared to other students in this faculty. And I undertook a 10-year cohort study to understand the factors that determine success and failure in the course. At this time, teaching and learning technology had improved. The department also purchased a fancy but cumbersome piece of equipment that could project text from a book onto a screen. The Gestette machine was pensioned off after a few years in favor of a photocopying machine to duplicate notes and tests. The management of student marks was all manual on large 3A triplicate mark sheets. The timetable was modernized to a large metal board with different colored Lego type blocks. Research data and multiple choice questions on the medicine and surgery paper had to be put onto data capturing cards and taken to Senate House on the main campus to be processed by the huge mainframe computer on the first floor. This mainframe computer spewed out boxes of results, not just a few pages, which then had to be moved to the department for processing. About this time, the department purchased the first desktop computer for the secretary. Computers were purchased for staff over time, and the introduction of emails revolutionized communication both within and outside of the, uni the university. In 1984, the department recognized that we had to prepare students to meet the needs of most of the population who lived outside the cities. As the university had links with the Gazankulu and Venda homelands, the department staff did an exploratory visit to determine the possibilities of a, com of a community block at hospitals in these areas. The gaining of permission, resources for transport and accommodation took time. But the 1985 fourth year class was the first group to complete the compulsory rural block, which at that time replaced the elective block. The rural clinical program extended the experience of both staff and students, and all staff did rural supervision on a rotation basis throughout the year. This plan coincided with the 1985 university plan to develop a rural campus at the newly purchased Witz Rural Facility. This multidisciplinary campus for research, student training, and community engagement in the rural communities of Bushbuck Ridge was launched in 1989. During this time, there was increasing opposition to the South African political situation. Mass meetings on campus were a regular occurrence as were demonstrations, marches, and processed action, which often resulted in altercations between staff, students, and security police. This created a complex teaching environment, and some students were much more affected than others. In 1987, Wilford Council meeting in Exeter, South Africa was severely criticized for the apartheid system and the oppressive laws and there was call for South Africa to be expelled from the organization. As Marge was the WFOT delegate, the visit, visit was co coordinated muchly by the department. Although South Africa was not expelled from the World Federation, we went through an extremely difficult period of political isolation where international conference attendance, professional exchange, and even acquisition of books and journals was banned, or almost dif and or extremely difficult. The rural experience led the department to be the first to invest in the training of community rehabilitation workers. Prior to this, a two-year community survey um, preceded the development of the training program in 1988 and 1989. So now I'm going to turn to the next time frame, which is 1990 to 2017. The recruitment to the CRW program used CRW principles, and this occurred in 1990, with the first intake in 1991. The training was, was located at Tinswalo Hospital, and although it was a founding program of the Witz Rural Facility. Teresa Lorenzo was the first course coordinator, and the university unit formed for this training was known as the Community Rehabilitation Research and Education Program, or CORE. CORE was 
initially internationally funded and later was funded by the Limpopo government. C the CRWs received a multidisciplinary rehabilitation trainee, namely aspects of OT, physio, and speech and hearing to enable them to work in communities and in people's homes. The training culminated in a certificate that was first offered by the department and later by the university. This program was very successful in bringing services to people with disabilities in these rural areas that had never had services before, and it was highly regarded in the faculty as being an innovative program. It also led to the development of coursework master's degree in community rehabilitation offered together with the School of Public Health that was completed by many OTs. This experience led to the development of two urban projects, one in Soweto, which is, was based at the, at the Zola Clinic, um, at the height of the Soweto riots, and, and di as direct contact with the community and home visits was a security risk. The other program was developed at Dipslert using CRW principles more effectively and was based at Bonalicedi, an NPO for people with disabilities. In the 1993 department's 50th birthday celebration, there were three international guest speakers with CRW experience. Sharon Brittman, later the World Federation president, who had experience with CRW programs in Indonesia, Ruth Levine, who was an expert in prevention strategies for physio and OT community-based programs for elders, and Shushadia Siskona, who developed the Thailand programs for persons with mental illness. The experience and ins inspiration from this symposium set the scene for the development of the new Clean Slate curriculum the, following the 94 election. The new curriculum was overseen by a combined clinical and academic committee called ACLIN. The purpose of this was to develop a new curriculum that spoke to the values of the democratic South Africa. We followed a complex curriculum change process developed in Kenya. Three two-day curriculum conferences were held where experts provided information to enable a critical macro and micro scan so as to define the professional and service delivery needs, competencies, educational principles for the curriculum, considering the views and strategic objectives of the university, faculty, our clinical partners and people with disabilities. Four principles emerged from these discussions. The curriculum should reflect the South African burden of disease, health service structure and emphasize primary health care. An adult education methodology should be used to promote lifelong self-study, critical thinking and critical reasoning, and deep rather than superficial learning. This acknowledged that a curriculum could not teach all possible eventualities. A biopsychosocial, occupation-based rather than medical model approach should underpin the curriculum, emphasizing health promotion, wellness and well-being, and inclu inclusive of illness and disability prevention. An, an integrated rather than siloed curriculum was required, and so the PBL curriculum was born. The nursing education department also introduced PBL in the, at the same time. We shared experiences and expertise assisted by four delegates who were sent to Egypt to learn from successful PBL programs in Africa. A PBL curriculum by its very nature is structured with teaching and learning organized around contextually relevant cases or scenarios where students problem solve using seven step process supported by literature and other resources. Problems are linked to learning activities such as tutorials and workshops and clinical work so as to develop the required theoretical and clinical competencies that are linked both vertically and horizontally about, about, uh, around the four years of study. This curriculum has been mapped against the HPCSA minimum standards, the SACWA competencies for our degree, and against two sets of WFIT minimum standards. 
Students took time to adapt to this more independent way of learning in small groups, especially as other courses were used more traditional methods of, of, of teaching. One challenge that, were, that we found in emphasizing the South African context and unique approach in South African occupational therapy was that most texts and research were from the global north and reflected practice in well-resourced areas. This led to Rose Crouch and Vivian Arler's editing two context-specific books, Occupational Therapy and Psychiatry in Mental Health in 1996, now in its sixth edition, and a much later book, Occupational Therapy and African Perspective. PBL approach requires teaching and learning with a collaborative approach where staff are committed to the integrity of the defined curriculum themes and content and method of teaching. Two additional important aspects were, were the introduction of the occupational science as one of the major courses, which was consistent with the international trends with, within the profession, and the other was the partnership with People for the Awareness of Disability Issues, PADI, which resulted in the inclusion of workshops to raise students' awareness of disability issues in the first year and a clinical experience of the daily lives of disabled people over time in their homes and the community context. This unique experience was expanded to the physio and speech therapists and was also responsible for the introduction of a rural visit to do disability survey in the third year. PBL has served the department well and has been proven to be an effective method of teaching and learning. A number of research projects explored and evaluated the clinical competencies of the PBL program. To make education more accessible and to develop a professional pipeline, the WITCBR certified program was converted to a two-year undergraduate diploma offered by the university in 1998. At the same time, training for occupational therapy technicians was also offered here in the department in Johannesburg also as a laddering proposal. These two programs had to be closed in 20, 2004 um, due to changes in regulations that prohibited universities from offering undergraduate diploma courses, and the negotiations to move the CRW training to the Technicon were curtailed by increasing reluctance by the physio board and the Health Department's Human Resource Commission, chaired by Professor William Pick, who, which no longer supported training and work of this cadre of worker. In 2020, Marge retired, and this marked a significant crisis for the department. As she had sabbatical leave owing, she took this in, 20, in 2001. The faculty used this, this time to advertise her post internationally as the search committee could not find a suitable South African candidate. Early in 2021, the post was re-advertised for a third time. This was a very difficult time for the department. We were not used to being rudderless and without a clear direction. Someone just had to step up and apply. And after much discussion and feeling more than pressured, I put in an application at the 11th hour and so fell into the big shoes that Marge had left. In 2001, the university underwent a restructuring and faculties were divided into schools. The department was included in the School of Therapeutic Sciences. Professor Celie Eels, a physio, was the first head of school. The development of, school, of the school had a very favourable outcome for the department. Probably the two most important benefits was access to the financial decision-making in the faculty and communication and participation in the faculty structures and committees. Associated with the restructuring was the implementation of the electronic university-wide student information system and the Oracle Finance and Procurement System. In 2003, Professor Max Price, then Dean of the Faculty, was, had his eye on our space in the hospital for the School of Clinical Medicine, and the OT and Physio departments were moved to the Kanya Building, which housed the Department of Home Economics on the education campus. The teaching space for OT, Physio, and the OTT program was at a premium, while other spaces in the building were hardly used. Two upstairs rooms were divided into a, war a rabbit warren of tiny airless offices that were boiling in summer and freezing in winter. 
To improve ventilation, a huge, hideous, galvanized iron pipe was erected from the ceiling in the passage and attached to an extractor fan. When it was switched on, it sounded like a Boeing ready for take-up, take-off, and if a stone got into the system, the noise was impossible to work. The continuous complaints and almost staff anarchy brought an unexpected first and only visit to the, from the Vice-Chancellor to the department. At this time, the OT department employed a secretary that had a mobility disability. We were incensed that the rehabilitation professionals were housed in an inaccessible building. After much haggling, eventually, and then we had a disability lift installed. In 2007, Professor Rothberg, then head of school, negotiated additional space in the Kanyo building as well as a refurbished grant from the Department of Education. The department was moved to the Letter Sutton, Letter Sutton down the road, which was previously the university's nursery school premises. The building had only office space. There were 21 staff in the building, physios upstairs, OTs downstairs. We had one telephone and a single data point. Despite the frustrations from the many infrastructure problems, this was a time where the staff got to know each other well and the beautiful gardens provide opportunities to de-stress and have picnic lunches. The move to the newly renovated building in 2008 was an important milestone in the department's development. We had good teaching space. All teaching spaces had data projections and computer connectivity and all staff had iPads. A computer room was created for the students, and this was an essential move as the electronic resource material was being used rather than printed resource material. Thus, the time was right for the introduction of a small e-learning unit, which was housed in the department but served the school. It was headed by Paula Barnard Ashton. The establishment of the Moodle platform enabled the move to blend the blended learning approach. The small unit paved the way for the establishment of e a state-of-the-art learning centre in which you are now seated. In 2009, the Kanya Lecture Theatre was refurbished. Permission was requested from the university to name this lecture, of, lecture theatre after Alan Rothberg in recognition of all he had done to expand and modernise our teaching space. With the new university naming policy, the name had to be changed to the Kanya Lecture Theatre. In 2010, the highlight of 2010 had nothing to do with academics. It was the year of the FIFA World Cup in South Africa. There was a general buzz in the faculty and school about the health preparations that that needed to be put in place and medical cover at all games. Soccer was the discussion at tea and lunchtime. The delegation of staff and students greeted the arrival of the soccer team by lining the streets below the Phyllis Tobias building in St. Andrew's Road. We were all in our South African t-shirts and armed with vivazellas. The singing, dancing and noise was totally crazy, but at the same time refreshing and unifying. Some weeks later we had a departmental sport afternoon, which I think was linked to the faculty sports day. There was deafening music, and the third year sold Buravos rolls, cakes, and cold drinks. Staff and students learned to dance the Macarena to the Waka Waka. All students were tasked with putting together a class soccer team, and the students played round-robin matches, and the winning team then played the staff. And who won? The staff won. Of course they did. Crazy, but it was such fun. In 2013, we celebrated the 70th year of the department. This was celebrated by four events. The Creative Ability Symposium, which paid tribute to Vona de Toy as an alumnus of the university. The School Research Day, we were allocated the opening session to showcase occupational therapy research. And papers were presented by myself, Lisa Wechner from UWC, and Teresa Lorenzo from UCT to showcase OTP's research across the country. In September, we celebrated with a breakfast in the newly renovated Witz Club. Frank Cronenberg of OT Without Borders fame was the invited speaker. He gave an inspirational and very passionate talk, and there were very few dry eyes in the audience. I was very proud to be an OT of that on that day and especially proud to have a VITS association. 
We were also awarded a grant by the Assistant Dean of Research to hold a writing retreat to produce articles for a celebratory journal. By 2014, the number of postgraduate students had risen significantly, and there were 10 PhDs, 19 students registered for Masters by Research only, and 54 students registered for Masters by Coursework, which has become the most popular option since the introduction of the block release system in 2010. Most of these students had completed coursework, but the, but the research was still outstanding. This bottleneck affected our throughput numbers and subsidy and led to a course change. The medical-related courses in first year were dropped and an occupational science and research model were introduced. Having an approved research protocol and ethical clearance was a requirement for passing the first year. WITS has always had the highest number of master students in the country, and while this is an achievement, Line with the university's move to a more postgraduate focus, it did mean that all staff with master's degree had a high research teaching load on top of their other teaching responsibilities. The increasing number of undergraduate students put considerable strain on our clinical training platform. First-year students had very reduced clinical contact time and were partnered with final-year students. Second-year students did their clinical work in non-hospital situations, and third- and fourth-year students did clinical work in more traditional sites in both hospitals and ur rural and urban contexts. One of the problems at this time was that the number of staff that uh, placements would take was limited by their OT. And in, in, at, at this time, I reported that there were 37 training sites across five provinces being used. This increased the staff traveling time for supervision purposes, but also because less traditional sites were being used, no OT staff were employed, and the university staff had to fill this gap. And while there was some DOE funding for sessional staff, sessional staff were very hard to come by. Significant events occurred in 2015 included Roshni Katari, a WITS graduate who'd been working in the UK and was an expert on Q research methodology, was invited to participate in the Carnegie WITS Alumni Diaspora program. This was the first time that we had been included in this program. The Fees Must Fall campaign resulted in protest action periodically throughout the year with violence and high levels of intimidation. All the windows on the south side of the building were also broken. Most concerning was the serious level of intimidation within our student body on social media directed at individual students and at class groups. During the period up to 2015, staff numbers remained the same despite regular motivations to increase the staff complement while the student intake had risen to 72 first-year students. The profile of the student body, however, remained of concern. In 2017, we were given two transformation posts which allowed for the recruitment of occupational therapists from previously disadvantaged groups who showed academic potential. In 2017, saw the introduction of severe financial austerity measures that resulted from the freeze must Fees Must Fall campaign. Perhaps my most difficult experience as head of department came in this year. A past student accused the department of racialism on a social media tweet to the vice chancellor. This shocked the department staff and the very public nature of the complaint resulted in a very difficult and painful investigation by the University Transformation Committee into department attitudes and practices. This experience and many others during this time taught me that to manage a department, the department needs a unified, dedicated and cooperative team. Time and effort needs to be invested in building this team and collective planning and decision making with commitment to students and the profession. So now let's move to today. My tenure as head of department ended in, or in April of 2018. Faslin Adams was appointed in June of that year as head of department, but did not complete her five-year term. Matty was appoint appointed in January of this year, and as you can see, has a young and vibrant staff. 
My reflections of today are more about from the outside looking in. The student body has continued to grow with the admission in one year of over 100. While WITS has the highest total number of undergraduate students, the numbers in uh, uh, this is only reflected in the first and second years, while the, uh, the largest numbers in the third and fourth year remain with UWC and UCT. While this may reflect um, admission numbers, it may also be symptomatic of the high failure rate in the first and second years, which has plagued the course for many years and seems higher than what is reported for other programs. The high number of students continues to plague the clinical platform challenges and uh, with more and more students that do not have their own transport and placements being off the university bus routes. The changes to the grouping number and length of clinical blocks in the final year and the introduction of the self-organized elective blocks are some of the strategies that have been introduced to manage the system. In keeping with the primary health care approach, students do more clinical work out of hospitals. While these strategies have, been, have had benefits, there's also been some educational challenges and losses which influence some clinical competencies. These changes should be critically evaluated in the curriculum developments that are underway. Another notable factor in change is the student profile, which is much more representative of the country and is a fact to celebrate and has always been a long-term goal. While much can be said about the, the COVID-19 and the effect that it's had on, on teaching, there is one thing that does need to be commented on, and that is the expertise within the department and the already blended learning program enabled a seamless transition to online teaching, although online session development for practical skills, especially those requiring clinical skills, was a serious challenge. The staff need to be specifically commended for the work that was done and the speed at which it was done. I think additionally, there is an increasing pressure in the university for all academic staff to have PhDs, and there is always a changing of the goalposts for promotion. It's highly commendable that the staff have opportunities to extend, have extended study periods out of the department and funding to buy sessional staff in for teaching. This, however, makes managing the teaching and supervi the supervision program complex with high numbers of of staff away from the department simultaneously. And so we move to tomorrow. The future is always filled with uncertainties, but there is one clear certainty, and that is that we have a profession with a well-articulated philosophy and a well-crafted skill set, the purpose of which is to promote health and wellness in individuals, groups, and communities within the four important occupational domains through active engagement and doing. This is well articulated in our new scope of profession and resonates with the achievement of many of the sustainable development goals of 2030. In our context, the occupational therapy domains of people are not, the, are not only compromised by health conditions, but by many social and economic conditions as well. Why health and education are our traditional areas of service delivery, perhaps the time is right for the exploration of other sectors where we can make a difference. This does not necessarily mean change in what we do or how we do it, but how to apply our philosophy and skill set to a different context. The WITS Learning and Teaching Plan of 2020 to 2024 provides the department with its educational ma mandate. It highlights four factors, the best up-to-date evidence-informed teaching and learning practices and th with the highest academic returns. It also informs shaping knowledge, skill and evidence that makes critical difference in the areas of service delivery, social responsibility and moral consciousness, and critical thinking, which is more society than personal orientated. Preparing students for professional practice may give the, de the department the opportunity to be a trendsetter within the profession, but you should not do this alone. There is an urgent need for the profession to be united and to talk with one voice, to articulate the profession and all it stands for, so that it's consistent with an agreed professional language understood by 
policymakers and those that fund our service. I think tomorrow is about change, and we as a profession cannot get what we want if we remain as we are. And change requires mastery of the challenges that not that only happen when you're at the end of your comfort zone. So in conclusion, I wish to w- wish the department the very best for the future. May you go from strength to strength. Let's uh, celebrate the contribution of both staff and students that come before us, those that are with us now and those that will be with us in the future. Let us fly the Witz flag high. I thank you for your attention.